The Secret Book of John has been called the Gnostic Bible. It is arguably the most classic of the classic Gnostic texts. Yet what if we don't approach it as a Gnostic document, but as a Christian one, or as a Gnostic Christian one? After all, the Secret Book of John, in its present form at least, as ostensibly Christian, it represents a dialogue between Jesus and John, son of Zebedee, a well-known disciple of Jesus. It speaks of the Father, the origin of Christ, a theory of the Trinity, the creation of humanity based on Genesis, and final salvation made possible by Christ's revelation. These are classic themes of Christian discourse, and Christian discourse is a kind of transformation of native Jewish discourse. In a previous generation, some scholars claimed that the core material of the secret book of John has no Christian elements in it at all. The frame story in this view Christianizes the core by presenting the secret book as a revelation of the risen Christ. Christ now speaks the entire content of the secret book of John, including its commentary on Genesis, as part of an extended dialogue with the Apostle John. The idea that the secret book of John was Christianized relies in part on the theory that the text summarized by Irenaeus of Lyon and against Heresies 1.29 was the initial version of the secret book of John and that this version lacked the frame narrative and the dialogue between Christ and John. One must observe, however, that the text summarized by Irenaeus already manifests Christian features, such as the appearance of Christ as the divine child in heaven, for instance, and that Irenaeus understood it as a text written by people claiming a Christian identity. If it was not perceived as Christian, Irenaeus would not have attacked it as a Christian heresy. Nevertheless, if Irenaeus did not have the whole of the secret book of John, but rather a section later woven into it, then one cannot say that the secret book of John was Christianized, since the secret book of John did not yet exist. When the secret book of John emerged, sometime after Irenaeus wrote, it was, from its origin, constructed as a Christian text, even if one observes that the secret book of John became increasingly Christian over time, evident when one compares the shorter and longer versions, there was likely never a time when the secret book of John was not Christian on some level. But who originally wrote the secret book of John? Jewish elements in the book, such as Hebrew and Aramaic names, and familiarity with interpretations that later show up in rabbinic literature, for instance, the idea that Eve was raped by the devil, might suggest a Gnostic author who emerged from a fringe group of Hellenized Judaism. An important question here is whether any group of Jews, no matter how Hellenistic or how fringe, would turn against their own deity and depict him as a bestial monster, a lion-serpent hybrid. There were certainly social crises for Jews in the early second century, yet there's no surviving evidence that any such crisis led Jews to turn on their own god. The only documentable figures who supported negative demiurgy, as I call it, were Christians. They included presumably Gentile Christian theologians like Vesalides and Marcion. Other Christians like Valentinus and his heirs took up what might be called neutral demiurgy, the view that the creator was not evil, but righteous and subordinate to the true God. 
To suppose that the vilification of the Creator is inherently unchristian is to accept a view of Christianity controlled by Irenaeus and his heirs. Arguably, both neutral and negative demiurgy are based on Gentile Christian assumptions. One of these assumptions was that the supposedly eternal law of Moses is not or is no longer valid. If the law of the Jewish Lord is not valid, or valid only for a certain time and for a certain ethnic group, then the Jewish Lord manifests his local and limited nature. The covenant of this local Lord is not permanent, but transient and mediated by lower angelic beings, such as we see in Galatians 3.19. To those who never grew up worshiping the Judean deity, Yahweh's claims to universality and singularity, such as Deuteronomy 32, 39, I, I am he, and there is none beside me. These claims would have sounded less like blessing and more like bluster. To be sure, Philo of Alexandria attests to the fact that some Jews were extreme allegorizers who read the Torah symbolically and rejected its practical implementation. At the same time, these allegorizers never attacked the laws of Moses or repudiated the stories in Genesis. Some interpreters, Philo says, scorned the stories of Genesis as myths, but they never attacked the creator revealed in Hebrew scripture. Both kinds of interpreters were thus distinct from those who attacked Yaldabaoth in the secret book of John. Such an attack presupposes that the Mosaic law is already, on some level, invalid, and that implementation of it, such as practicing circumcision, for instance, is not only unnecessary, but actually wrong and contrary to salvation. In the late 2nd and early 3rd centuries CE, the only persons propounding these sorts of ideas were Christians. One of these Christian interpreters, probably an Alexandrian, had earlier claimed that an evil angel wheedled the Jews into practicing literal circumcision. This is from the Epistle to Barnabas 9.4. Now, the distance between an evil angel and an evil creator might seem large, but the idea that the creator god of the Jews was evil had already been canvassed by Egyptian writers who wrote counter-narratives against the Hebrew myth of the Exodus. Gentile Christians in Egypt had only to conclude that the god of the Old Testament, who forbade the fruit of knowledge, regretted the making of humanity, and who wiped them out with a flood, was not, in fact, the God preached by Jesus. Second century Christian debates about what could and could not be appropriated from the Hebrew scriptures is the natural arena in which a Gnostic critical attitude to the Hebrew deity could develop. Gnostics, in short, are Christians who could not suppress the violence of the Hebrew God or see him as the father of Jesus Christ. Although in the first and early second centuries CE, Jewish and Christian were still very fluid signifiers, by about 200 of the common era, most Christians of Gentile extraction had distinguished themselves, at least from Jewish practices and institutions. This process was accelerated in Alexandria, where a massive pogrom in this city during the Diaspora Revolt of 115 to 117 meant that the previously large Alexandrian Jewish population lost most of its cultural capital, and Gentile Christians were free and indeed motivated to carve out their own distinctive identities. 
At the same time, these Christians did not suddenly forget that their cult and their Messiah emerged from the Jewish matrix. They still used Jewish scriptures, traditions, interpretive methods, and in many cases, Judaic names and phrases to advance their identities. Whoever wrote the secret book of John, at least, was deeply familiar with Jewish exegetical traditions, Hebrew and Aramaic names for angels and the Jewish deity, not to mention a range of texts from Jewish scripture. Such knowledge could equally suggest a Jewish or an anti-Jewish identity. The fact that the secret book of John primarily rewrites the first chapters of Genesis does not mean that the secret book of John was solely a Jewish text. In antiquity, the book of Genesis was a lightning rod for both Jewish and Christian interpretation. The devotees of Jesus read Jewish literature like 4th Ezra and 2nd Baruch, and they even composed new fictions in which ancient Jewish sages speak, for instance, in the Testament of the Twelve Patriarchs. They used the classic translation of Jewish scriptures, the Septuagint, a translation which Jews in the course of the second century were increasingly abandoning to the Christians. There seems to be little doubt that the author of the secret book of John used the Septuagint to selectively attack the book of Genesis. The secret book of John is therefore most probably to be read as a Christian book, a manifestation of one of the many Christian anti-Jewish texts, which ironically are based on Jewish traditions. One might imagine an original secret book of John shorn of its secondary framework and interpolations as a form of rewritten scripture. But the whole category of rewritten scripture or rewritten Bible has been recently criticized as diffuse and unrecognized in antiquity, not to mention the fact that sharing away the Christian elements is risky and artificial. The Secret Book of John manifests a plethora of genres, including romance, philosophical treatise, cosmogony, true history, and wisdom monologue. Overall, however, the genre of revelation dialogue seems to be a fair description of the final product. A revelation dialogue can be thought of as a Christian adaptation of the philosophical dialogue. In the mid-2nd century, the Platonist Albinus distinguished instructional and investigative dialogues. The instructional type is appropriate for teaching, for practice, and the demonstration of truth Investigative dialogues, in turn, train the reader to argue and refute what is false. There's a bit of both in the Sacred Book of John, but it's primarily instructional, and the instruction chiefly occurs by revealing truths as opposed to making logical arguments. As a Christian product, the Sacred Book of John can also be named a dialogue gospel. Gospel literature, broadly defined, is any type of literature involving the saving acts or message of Jesus. Thus, the Gospel of Thomas is a gospel, although it has no continuous narrative, and the Egyptian gospel is a gospel, though it's primarily an ecstatic liturgy. In dialogue gospels, Jesus is typically the main speaker, and he speaks with a range of disciples who ask brief and programmatic questions. As a dialogue gospel, the secret book of John fits in nicely with the wisdom of Jesus Christ and the dialogue of the Savior, two of its companion texts in Codex Three of the Nagamani Library. As a quote-unquote classic Gnostic text, the Secret Book of John has also been called Sethian, and arguably the earliest complete version of the Sethian myth. The modern use of the name Sethian is based on a typology of themes and literary figures which a set of mostly Nagamati texts share. Nevertheless, the Sacred Book of John features more than mere Sethian traditions. It also mixes in Barbelloite and Ophite mythology. Adam's son Seth and his seed certainly appear in the Sacred Book of John, but they do not seem to be particularly prominent. Seth is not highlighted as the Redeemer. His blinkered appearance among the four lights does not suggest a solid integration. Even if we attempt to preserve a Sethian or Gnostic or classic Gnostic 
category for understanding the secret book of John, we should remember that Sethian and Gnostic identities overlapped with Christian ones. Unfortunately, the modern construction of Sethianism or Sethian Gnosticism has led some interpreters to conclude that there was an independent Gnostic myth and or movement often said to have emerged from Judaism that was originally unchristian and subsequently and selectively Christianized. Such a theory is not supported by the data in the secret book of John. Due to the problematic and overdetermined category of Sethianism, my approach is not to categorize the secret book of John as a Sethian text, pure and simple, but as a Christian one in accordance with the manifestly Christian features of its final form. At the same time, one could label it Sethian Christian, written by a Christian or set of Christians identifying with the immovable race and the seed of Seth. It's debated whether the secret book of John was written by an independent writer or set of writers, or whether these writers belong to a concrete Christian group. One way to test the theory of a group identity is to identify specific ethical and liturgical practices in the text that reflect a communal ethos. It's fair to say that the secret book of John is an ascetic text. At the same time, there's a dispute as to whether it actually prohibits sex. According to one theory, the secret book implies that its ideal readers, like Adam, by rejecting carnal marriage and procreation, receive restoration to that primordial spiritual marriage and union with the divine spirit. In this view, carnal marriage is the radical antithesis to a spiritual union, and sexual intercourse and procreation are the demonic imitation of spiritual increase, and they remain anathema to those reborn by the spirit. This view has considerable support in the secret book of John, Codex 3. First, there's the remark that the snake symbolizes the sowing of lust, the defilement of destruction. The phallic snake is allegorized as sexual lust. And even clearer is the remark that, till this day, sex was instituted and perpetuated by the first ruler. He sowed in Adam the lust for reproducing, so that from this nature the rulers sowed their likeness. If the first ruler, a.k.a. Yaldabaoth, is evil, then sex and sexual desire, the lust for material reproduction, would seem to be part of his evil plan. Sex was part of Yaldabaoth's malign strategy to distract human beings from understanding their true nature. Yaldabaoth invented sex and was the first to perform it. He mated with ignorance, or in some versions, madness. He paired his lower powers with female partners, he created Eve, raped her, and launched his angels to have sex with other women as well. On the face of it then, the secret book of John presents a myth hostile toward sexual activity. Read in terms of social practice, the secret book seems to laud an ideal community, free from both sex and sexual desire. As counter evidence, one could cite Adam's quotation of Genesis 2.24 after Eve is created, quote, now you are bone from my bone and flesh from my flesh. For this reason, the human will leave his father and mother and stick to his wife so that the two become one flesh. Among most Jewish and Christian interpreters, this verse was an obvious validation of sexuality within marriage. The passage in the secret book goes on to say that the mother's partner was sent to make right her deficiencies. If the mother on high is married and made right by marriage, then marriage on earth should be approved as well. Yet one must examine the context of the secret book of John, Codex 3. Before Adam quotes this passage, he recognizes his joint essence, a joint essence that is never explicitly identified with Eve. In fact, Eve is never named in the secret book of John, Codex 3. Adam's joint essence seems to refer to Luminous Insight, who, having long abided in Adam, had just lifted the veil from Adam's mind. Accordingly, Adam's citation of Genesis 2.24 does not initiate his involvement in carnal sex, but rather his restoration to the primordial union with his true partner and helper, Luminous Insight. This is spiritual sex, not carnal. Adam's true wife is Insight, not Eve. According to the secret book of John, Luminous Insight enters into the newly creative Eve, 
but this point is never admitted in the Codex 3 version. Here, Yaldabaoth makes a secondary formation in the shape of a woman, but he himself is unable to grasp luminous insight. Thus, he could not transfer insight from Adam to Eve. The reader might infer that luminous insight independently leapt into Eve, but that itself is an interpretive leap. The next time insight appears in the narrative, she's not in Eve, but in an eagle roosting on the tree of knowledge. On the basis of the secret book of John Codex III, then, it's imprecise to say that Eve herself illuminated Adam. One could still argue, however, that the creator's invention of sex was another unsuccessful ploy of the lower rulers to dominate humanity. According to this theory, the rulers meant sex for evil, to copy themselves and their image, but the first couple used it for good, to sexually produce Seth without sexual desire. Rather than act from polluting desire, Adam begot Seth when he recognized his spiritual essence in Eve, so that Seth was born through intercourse, but according to the pattern of divine reproduction. Although the secret book of John Codex III does not say that Adam recognized his spiritual essence in the material Eve, Adam does father Seth according to the model of the higher family among the aeons. Yet what act of Adam follows the model of the higher family? Is it Adam's act of reproduction? The fact that he can reproduce himself acting as a father? Or is it his act of sex? Or both? In the context of the secret book of John in Codex 3, it's not likely that Adam's sexual act accords with a heavenly model for two reasons. First, and unlike the report of Irenaeus, the authors of the secret book of John do not accept the idea that the eternities formed pairs in order to sexually reproduce. There is a heavenly Adamas and a heavenly Seth, but the heavenly Adamas does not have sex with a heavenly Eve, and Seth does not have heavenly wives to produce his heavenly seed. The only higher beings that have sex are the middle management powers and authorities who are yoked by Yaldabaoth. Second, the secret book of John says that Adam knew his lawlessness in the Codex 3 version. This reading would indicate that Adam's act of sex was itself lawless. Sex meant that Adam realized his lawless sexual impulse, a negatively colored impulse implanted by Yaldabaoth. In effect, Yaldabaoth first implanted negative sexual desire in Adam, and Adam then used it to produce Seth. At the same time, the idea that Seth is born according to the model of the higher family might suggest that Seth was born asexually, as births occur in the divine realm. In Genesis 4.25, of course, it's clear that Eve conceives and bears Seth. But in the secret book of John Codex 3, Adam knows his likeness, and he alone fathers Seth. Most readers still infer that Eve must have produced Seth somehow, but if Adam mated with insight his true essence, then she would be Seth's real mother. It's not the case that insight is always identified or even associated with the earthly woman, Eve. Now, admittedly, the versions of the secret book of John seem to disagree on this very issue, but in the secret book of John Codex III, at least, carnal sex is not validated, even if it produces Seth, ancestor of the redeemed. In theory, there might be sex without sexual desire, but this position is not clearly advocated in the secret book of John Codex III, Accordingly, sexual reproduction is probably not part of the divine plan, which contributes to salvation. One can grant that the reproduction of Seth's seed contributes to salvation, but sex with Eve, the woman of flesh and blood, is not thereby validated or promoted as something good. After all, Seth's seed is not, or not primarily, biological. People recognize Seth as their ancestor by accepting the truth of Sethian lore, not because their Sethian parents had sex. Accordingly, Sethian Christians supported spiritual sex and marriage with luminous insight. In terms of social practice, however, they preferred and promoted celibacy, at least for the full members of the Sethian Christian group. This is a distinctive ethical position, opposed to the more common view represented by Clement of Alexandria that sex within marriage was acceptable for Christians if it was performed for reproduction not for enjoyment. Sethian Christians were not entirely unique in promoting celibacy, however. They would have joined the ranks of other Christian thinkers and groups such as Julius Cassianus. 
the author of the Testimony of Truth, and Marcionite Christians, who, by the late second century, had made it to Alexandria. If the authors of the Secret Book of John promoted a distinctive ethic of celibacy, did they also mark their identities by ritual innovation? In several Christian groups, the rituals performed on earth were projected onto the heavenly world. The same seems to be implied in the Sethian Christian society. For example, the father is bathed in a primordial light water, which might indicate the original waters of baptism. If so, this primal baptism of the father led to the production of thought, which might reflect the enlightenment received in earthly baptism. Clement called baptism enlightenment or photismos because it conveyed saving knowledge. There is also the primal anointing of the Christ figure who is smeared with goodness or Christhood. This heavenly act might hint at some corresponding rite of anointing on earth. Anointing with unspeakable ointment was a Nicene Christian rite. One might speculate that Sethian Christians for whom Christ became perfect by anointing also anointed themselves in a rite to complete their baptism. The longer version of the secret book of John mentions the five seals. This rite, whether it was a rite of baptism, of anointing, or both, appears as a distinctive act of a particular community. Debate continues about its actual process. Perhaps the five seals was a rite of anointing with oil or perfumed ointment following baptism in living water. If eyes, ears, mouth, nose, and skin were anointed, then these five senses received the five seals. Alternatively, it was the baptism itself that involved a fivefold immersion or lustration in water. Sethian Christians would have renounced worldly life as they were dunked or sprinkled, and spiritual powers would have been invoked over them. After anointing, they were clothed and enthroned to signify a new status. The heavenly rites of thanksgiving and glorification mentioned in the secret book might also hint at a liturgy practiced on earth. Barbello gives glory to the invisible spirit for her attendants. These attendants in turn give glory to the invisible spirit and to Barbello. Christ and his attendants perform a similar courtly ritual of glorification when they come into existence. Adamus proclaims the longest doxology, I give glory and I bless the invisible spirit. He says, because of you, all things exist within you. I bless you and the self-born and the eternal one, the Trinity, father, mother, child, the perfect power. This polished and elevated language could be taken to reflect a distinctive ritual culture, whether by accident or by intention, Sethian Christians believed that the structures of earth represented those in heaven. One can hypothesize that they would have imitated ritual and liturgical structures that they thought happened in heaven. From our perspective, these Christians projected elements of their own ritual life onto a heavenly plane. From their own perspective, however, heaven was the real world and our world, the paltry imitation. All this evidence, admittedly inferential, indicates that the secret book of John represents a distinctive ethical and ritual life. Probably then, the literature reflects a living community of Sethian Christians in early third century Alexandria. The very fact that a new and expanded version of the secret book of John emerged in the course of the third century indicates that this text, considered to be a sacred revelation from Christ, to his most beloved apostle, required updating for a living community. To sum up, the sacred book of John is a distinctly Christian text. This is not to deny that it's also a classic Gnostic text. Yet, one should not overload these terms with modern meanings. The sacred book of John is Gnostic to the extent that it is meant for knowers, true knowers, in a Christian community. It is classic to the extent that it became the paradigm text for this community and was, relative to other texts in the Nag Hammadi Library, broadly known and circulated in antiquity. The Sacred Book of John presents the major themes of the quote-unquote Gnostic religion, but that religion, as it turns out, was yet another form of Christianity, a form unfamiliar and even shocking to us, but no less valid than any other.